Welcome to the latest Informing Choices podcast. The pandemic has irrevocably changed our world, but what might be the legacy of the pandemic for the food, beverage and agri-food industries and the very future of food? Futurist speaker and foresight strategy consultant Tony Hunter argues that in crises there's opportunity and we need to make the most of this one and use technology to fundamentally change our food system. Tony, welcome to the podcast. Tell us a little bit about you and your work. Thanks, Steve, and thanks for having me on the podcast. Well, my background is food science and technology, and I've been in the food industry for 30 plus years, a lot of that time in the red and white meat industry. And you know, about, say, four or five years ago, I just noticed how quickly things were changing in the food industry and that the future of the food industry has been fundamentally changed by these new technologies that were coming in. Technologies on the face of it have nothing to do with food, but are having such a dramatic impact on the food industry, and I think will do for you know, the foreseeable future, 10, 20, 30 years down the track. In your chapter in, in the new book, Aftershocks and Opportunities to Navigating the Next Horizon, you, I'm going to ask you the impossible question now. You, you talk about five technologies shaping the post-pandemic food future. If you had to pick one or two of the most critical, um, which do you think they might be? Oh, that's it. You are putting me on the spot there. I think if I had to pick, my top one would be synthetic biology, which is basically the marrying of all sorts of technologies from engineering and biology, and particularly genetic engineering, into one discipline, and the reason I say that will change is the one I pick is because it can affect so many industries, not just the food industry. We're talking about not just food. We're talking about um, all sorts of um, things that are currently made through chemical synthesis are going to be able to be made far more efficiently and effectively through biological synthesis. Biology has always been the, uh, the, the poor cousin to chemistry and physics, but no longer. It won't be that's not rocket science. In 10 years, how it'll be, well, it's not synthetic biology, is it? <laughs> and, and how might synthetic biology Im improve food production then? I mean, are, are we talking about a possible solution to um, uh, growing resilient plants, growing resilient food, potentially eradicating areas of food poverty and, and famine, for example? Look, I think you're right. There are so many things that synthetic biology can do. It's a matter of what it can't do. But I think picking a few there, synthetic biology and these biological systems are so much more efficient and effective in their use of resources. Hmm. So biological systems, when you think of what a wonderful collection human beings and other animals are and the things that our bodies can do, that biology can do, um, it really puts other things into the shade. So, for instance, if we look at some of the things in synthetic biology, there are a couple of things that people will be well aware of are insulin. Insulin has been made by synthetic biology since 1982. No truck loads of pig pancreases, train loads going in and making a few grams of insulin. They put the genes for insulin into the microbes and they make insulin. People have been injecting it into their body for 30, 40 years now. And the other one people are probably unknowingly familiar with is cheese. When you make cheese, you separate the curds and the whey. And that used to be made by taking the fourth stomach of a two day old dead calf, putting it in some milk, separating out the curds and whey and making cheese. But in the eighties, looking at where cheese was going and the fact that people really weren't so keen on just growing more and more calves and killing them at two or three days old, they came up with a way of making the enzyme from rennet called chymosin by synthetic biology. So if you've been eating hard cheeses in places like the UK, US and Australia, 90% of those cheeses are made via using chymosin from genetically modified organisms to separate the curds and whey to make the cheese. So that's been going around for a long, long time. And we can make all sorts of interesting ingredients and other components via synthetic biology. And one of the things we're looking at at the moment is something called plant molecular farming, where you take the gene for casein, 
from cows, you put it in soybeans, you grow the soybeans, you extract the casein and use the casein to make cheese and you process the rest of the soy protein as well. So you can make cheese without cows. Whey protein is the same. That's the byproduct of cheese making is whey protein. You can make whey protein by taking that gene again for the whey protein out of an animal, putting it into a microbe, a yeast, a company called Perfect Day is doing this and producing whey protein. So we're looking at, we can make cheese and whey protein and other things without the animal. So we're addressing things there, greenhouse gas emissions, use of resources, and the sheer fact that we're going to need almost double the amount of animal agriculture and other products in the next years. So how do we make that effective and efficiently? We can't just simply clone and duplicate the current food system. It's, it's not gonna happen, not enough land and water on the planet to do it. So we need these sorts of technologies to be able to do that. And I think you can see that's how powerful synthetic biology is. There's not much they can't do. And we're barely scratching the surface of the power of synthetic biology at the moment. That's absolutely fascinating. I think we'd need a whole other several podcasts probably to talk about the sustainability implications that that you touched on there. I mean, one of the other critical areas, I guess, is uh, supply chains. And we saw the impact of the pandemic on supply chains early on in the COVID crisis. And you cite some clear examples in your chapter of where those supply chains broke down. So how do we build resilience into food supply chains in the future? Well, the problem with the food supply chains is the way the current food system is set up is they work very well and everything works well. Yeah. Uh, you know, if for chickens, for instance, chickens about 30 to 35 days and that's it. No one wants a 40 day old chicken. So we saw in the pandemic, particularly in the US slaughterhouses closing down. We saw some of that in Germany as well. And therefore, where do, you, where do you put the chickens? Same thing with pigs. Pigs generally about six months, seven, eight, nine months, don't want them. So the cattle industry is a little bit more flexible in what it can do. But those particular industries, you've got, and you think about it, you've got to get the eggs and then you've got to hatch the eggs and you've got to grow them and then you've got to kill them. And it's a continuous cycle. You break that cycle for a week there are weeks worth of animals there that are not going to meet specification. Yeah. What do you do with them? They were literally plowing the ground and burying them in the US because there's just nothing else to do with them. There was nobody there to kill them. So they had to kill them before they could get killed. So that was the, that was a big problem there. And what we see is, and is the chain, everything works, everything works well, that's great. But even the lack of travel out of Norway, a huge portion, I, you know, up around 90% of their product is put on planes. Their salmon is put on planes. And when the plane stopped, what do you do? Yeah. So we, we built ourselves quite a complicated food production system. And I think COVID really demonstrated how potentially fragile that can be, that if you knock one part, then the domino effect throughout the whole industry is extremely high. Same thing with milk, dumping milk down the drains because there's nothing to do with it. They had nowhere to go. So I think that shows that fragility. And we had some countries in Europe only for a short period of time who decided not to export for, for a while until they saw what happened. And as I say, those countries that have food in a crisis will keep it for their own population, for better or for worse. And the rest of the world just has to wear it. And I think that is the real fragility of our food system is we have people across the whole planet, but we have food production concentrated in some particular areas where there is that arable land and the fresh water, what I call the, the twin tyrannies of fresh water and arable land. If you have lots of both, you have lots of food. If you don't have much of one or the other, you have a problem. So what's the solution in the future? Is the solution, actually going back to synthetic biology, growing plants and food um, in locations we haven't perhaps been able to before, or are there, are there other ways we might build resilience into supply chains? I think you hit on a good one there, Steve. There's lots of products around now that have been sitting on the shelves who have been gene edited for low water, for higher temperatures, but people haven't seen the need for them and the bogey of GMO, you yeah. know, which um, as I say, I gave you a couple of examples 
samples there, people had been injecting themselves the product of a genetically modified organism and eating something made with a product of a genetically mod modified organism. And if I say to people, you're going to stop eating cheese, I've got no one yet that said, I'm going to stop eating cheese. <laughs> thing. I know right. that. Or I demand you go to kill more calves so I can have cheese. I, 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 don't, I don't hear that. So I think that is one of the things, though, is really brings up a good point, Steve, is transparency. We need to be transparent with what these technologies are, how they work, engage the consumer in the conversation, show them why we need these technologies and the issues that we're going to have to face. Because up until now, it's been, you know, we go back to the 60s, three and a half billion people, less than half of what we've got now. Resources seemed endless. Throw it away in the berry in the ground, grow some more, clear a bit more land to grow the crops. It was no problem. Um, as we approach now, where we are about 7.9 million now, as we approach nine and a half, 10 billion people, that is no longer an option. We're reaching planetary boundaries. You put too many rats in the one place with only a certain amount of food. We all know that doesn't end well for some of the rats, right? Yeah. So we're the same. In the end, there's only so many of us the planet can support, but we've come to expect that what the planet can do to recycle our waste and provide us with resources is endless. It's not. So we need to realise that. I mean, because one of the things that we've been talking about, as well as um, uh, some of the potential opportunities, is we've been we've also been talking about what some of the really significant challenges are for food supply system. So. If we kind of flip that to some extent, what do you see as the single greatest opportunity for the future of food production? I think the greatest opportunity is, as we say, crisis and opportunity. And the threats that we've got around the availability of food and those, those twin tyrannies of arable land and fresh water. Now, a lot of these technologies don't use much of one or the other, or sometimes both of those. There is nothing magical about the fact that we get our protein from animals and we get our protein from plants. We could get it from algae. We can get it from biomass, which is those uh, this is in the UK and, and Australia. The best example of biomass, Marmite and Vegemite. That's biomass for you, yeast biomass. So you've been in biomass for a long time. Now you can treat it differently and texturize that and make alternative protein products. So the real opportunity is not as the World Resources Institute says, we need to stop people eating so much and we need to divert that back to feed other people because there's enough food on the planet. To which I say, we've been telling people to eat less for the last 10 or 20 years because they get lifestyle diseases and they will die if they do it. How's that working for us? Yeah. Do you then think that telling people to eat less and do that so that other people won't die when they don't care that they're going to die? I don't see that working very well. So I say what we need to do is sustainably and equitably distribute the means of production via these new technologies, rather than say, we're simply going to ship container loads and plane loads of things, causing more greenhouse gas emissions, more food miles on top of everything. Why not put these new technologies into developing countries that don't have arable land or fresh water that they need and use those technologies, reimagine the food system given these new technologies so that we can localize the means of production rather than saying no we're simply just going to ship it around the world and hey if anything happens and we can't send you some for a while that's just going to be tough luck you know we're very fortunate we may not realize it and i don't like to use the fortunate because it's tragic the deaths that we've seen but if covid were like some of its sister viruses we'd be seeing 10 and 20 percent death rates yeah. Would we then still be seeing food flowing freely around the world? Would we see the, the, the food system coping as well as it has? I would suggest absolutely not. And that if so, if we continue the current food system, we will have another pandemic at some stage. My background's microbiology, and I reckon that whether it's five years, 10 years, or 15, it's going to be another one. Yeah. And it may be a lot worse. So, how will the food system be resilient enough to survive that? As I say, sustainably and equitably distribute the means of production. Don't just tell people and promise them we're going to send them shiploads of product. I, I, I love that phrase you use then, reimagining um, uh, the food system, which, uh, you know, it's kind of really resonated uh, with me. Lovely. 
Tony, um, time has beaten us. That was uh, absolutely marvellous. Thank you so much for your time. Tell us, how can people contact you, find out more about what you do? Oh, thanks, that, Steve. Yeah, look, uh, you'll find me everywhere. If you simply Google Food Futurist, I'm number one on the first page of Google. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you can get me on my website, which is www.futuristforfood.com. That's my expert and consulting website. I consult the industry. I also have TonyHunterSpeaker.com. And you'll find me on Twitter as well. So if you Google me around the place, Steve, you'll come across me somewhere. All the usual places. <laughs> the usual suspects, yes, Steve. <laughs> Tony, thank you so much for your time. That was wonderful. No, it's been my pleasure, Steve. Thanks for the opportunity. Take care. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Do let your friends and colleagues know about the Informing Choices mini pod, and I'll see you on a future episode very soon.